grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Before we started the service, there was a pre-service video. And uh, the man who, who was in the video started like this. Hear me, O God, for I am fighting. And he listed a few things. But it was relevant to tonight's message. The problem was it was played to a near empty church. And there were a few doctrinally challenging thoughts in that, but the thing, key thing is the very first line will be very relevant to tonight's message. So before we get into the message, can we all look to the Lord in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord, as we continue to worship tonight. We pray that we will experience your loving touch for those who are saved because you live in us. We pray, Lord, as we go through challenges in our lives, we know from your word how to handle them. So tonight and uh, this morning in other parts of the world. We pray that your voice will be heard by us, that we will be paying close attention and have an obedient heart to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we begin <clears throat> the study, I wanted to just uh, give you some kind of pointers as I call as desirable actions. Number one, if you have the Bible in your hands, that would be good. Because I'll be having eye contact with you for most of the time. So keep your Bible. And if you have the notes taking habit, that's even better. But the best is ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Whether you are on Zoom or here inside, try to pay full attention. If you can avoid, particularly if you're in the room, kind of continuous yawning. Once in a way, that's fine, if possible. If you need rest, you need rest. Don't snore loudly. Those who are on Zoom, those who are on Zoom, if the audio level is not good enough, please stop me by unmuting yourself. As sometimes the Zoom chats you send may not be immediately seen. If you tell me by unmuting yourself, I will make necessary changes. And I will work with the booth to adjust the volume. Because sometimes when we post the videos on YouTube, people say the volume is not sufficient. Because we don't know don't, whether the volume is good enough on the Zoom as compared to what is inside this room. And those who are on Zoom, if you're not comfortable coming to church due to what's going on around, thanks for joining by Zoom. The Lord needs you for the kingdom work, active. Don't feel bad about having to join by Zoom. What is more important 
is whether you have the right relationship with the Lord before we, the preachers, put our stress on fellowshipping with one another. So it is okay if you stay on Zoom. But make sure you have a good relationship, a solid relationship with the Lord. Finally, the message format. It is an application-oriented message throughout, from the beginning, with only one critical application reserved for the end. It may not sound relevant to the message, but after careful thought and in obedience, I figured that that is very relevant, not to everybody, but to a couple of people in this room and maybe on the Zoom. So with that said, the message begins now. I've been struggling a bit to put together this message. So I sought some help. You can call it as crowdsourcing. I wanted to know some of the answers from people. So I sent out a list of questions. And people did respond. I did not send the questions to the church group. I sent it out to my different Bible study groups. And I got quite a few responses. The question number one is, is prayer easy for us? Now, you can think. You don't have to say it aloud. In your mind, have an opinion or an answer. Is prayer easy for us? Number two, what is the cost of prayer? Number three, is prayer a strenuous exercise? Is prayer a strenuous exercise? exercise. Number four, if we struggle to pray, what does it mean? What does it indicate? If we struggle to pray, what does it indicate? Now, we're going to see a verse from Proverbs 117. This is the the application point that will come back at the end. If a bird sees a trap being set, it knows to stay away. I took it intentionally from a very diluted translation of the Bible. If a bird sees a trap being set, it knows to stay away to get into the mainstream of the message. Turn your Bible with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 to 19. Ephesians 6, 12 to 19. For we do not wrestle against, the, against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me 
in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So the message, you can call it as an expository teaching or you can take it as a topical one. This is, by the way, part three of our prayer series. I had to take a break because of Christmas season. We had to take a break and then we're continuing the thought. You can call it either of those or you can call it as a mix of expository to a topical or a topical to an expository. Method is not critical at all. Some preachers brag about, want to preach nothing but expository. Some people say, I want to preach only topical. It doesn't matter as long as you speak the word of God and let the Holy Spirit speak to the hearers. Your method doesn't matter. Paul, from Ephesians 6, 12 to 19, if you see, he uses or takes the illustration of battle and applies it at once to what goes on in a believer's life. Watch this next line. This is the crux of the matter for tonight's message. The whole meaning of taking the armor of God is for only one thing, is for prayer. The whole meaning of taking the armor of God is for prayer. If you think about it, prayer is the position the enemy, the devil, Satan is struggling for. The struggle is around the position of prayer and the simplicity of prayer. Prayer, my friends, is easy for us because of what it cost God to enable us to pray. It is the redemption of God, the agony of our Lord that has made our salvation so easy and prayer so simple. When we put the emphasis on the line of prayer being a cost to us, we are wrong. The cost to us is nothing. It is a supreme and superb privilege marked by supernatural ease because of what it caused to God. The tendency nowadays is to worship prayer. Stress is put on nights of prayer and the difficulty and cost of prayer. It is not that prayer is strenuous, but the overcoming of our own laziness. If we make the basis of prayer our effort and agony and nights of prayer and so on and so forth, we mistake the basis of prayer. The basis of prayer again is not what it costs us, but what it cost God to enable us to pray. We will divide this portion, Ephesians 6, 12 to 19, in three parts. And to easily remember it, there will be some key phrases that will come across, but glue, be glued to your Bibles. The first one is, if you are the Lord's own, you will be continuously in the practice of praying continuously. That's the key word. We will take verses 12 and 13, those two verses, to think about what it means by continuously in the practice of praying, particularly if you are the Lord's own. 
if you are not the Lord's own, if you have not surrendered your life to Christ, this message won't make any sense. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. You have a vision how to how to reach the world how to do mission work it's all very well to have a vision beautiful glorious big vision but we must be continuously in practice of prayer why? So that we can find ourselves to handle things easily. When we find ourselves in a tight place, we can perfectly fit to meet the emergency. One of the greatest difficulties in time of war is to find a man who can keep his head when everyone else is losing theirs. It is only done by steady practice. Verse 13, the first part says this, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, not to fight, but to stand. Is fighting in prayer, fighting, now it should resonate in your mind, fighting if, is that in your vocabulary. Look at that verse again. We are not told to attack, to storm the force of darkness. What are we told to do? We are told to stand. You see that word stand? Unpanicky and unbudged more than conquerors. A conqueror is one who fights and wins. A more than conqueror is one who easily and powerfully overcomes. The struggle is not against flesh and blood, it is against principalities and powers. We cannot touch them by intellect or organization, or by courage or foresight or forethought. We cannot touch them at all unless we are based on redemption. The armor is not given. We have to take it. It is there for us to put on understanding what we are doing. We have the idea that prayer is for special times. But when we have to put on the armor of God for the continual practice of prayer so that any struggling onslaught of the powers of darkness cannot touch the position of prayer. When we pray easily, it is because Satan is completely defeated in his onslaughts. On the other hand, when we pray with difficulty, it is because Satan is gaining victory. We have not been continuously practicing. That is the clue and application as you think through it. We have not been facing things courageously. We have not been taking our orders from the Lord. Think about what Jesus said when it comes to prayer. 
Our Lord did not say, go or do. He said, watch and pray. Watch and pray. If we struggle in prayer, it is because the enemy is gaining ground. If prayer is simple to us, it is because we have the victory. There is no such thing as a holiday for the beating of your heart. You agree? Right? If there is, what comes next? The grave. Right? When the heart stops working. Same way, there is no such thing as a moral or spiritual holiday. If you attempt to take a holiday, spiritually, the next time we want to pray, it's going to be a struggle because the enemy has gained the victory all around. Darkness has come down and spiritual wickedness in high places has enfolded or engulfed us. If we have to fight, mark this word carefully, if you have to fight, why? It is because we have disobeyed. We ought to be more than conquerors. Look at second part of verse 13. And having done all to stand firm. It's a mental state as regards confidence. No panic. What is it puts us into a panic mode? All the time the heart's beat goes to 100 plus. All the time. Panic, 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 panic. What is that that causes us to be in a panicky mode? Think about this. The devil is a bully. But he cannot stand for a second before God. When we stand in the armor of God, he pays no attention to us. But if we tackle the devil in our own strength, we are done for. If we stand in God's armor with the strength and courage of God, he cannot gain one inch of way. And the position of prayer, if it is held as far as we are concerned, we will be untouched by his wiles. Confidence in the natural world is self-reliance. In the spiritual world, it is God-reliance. You understand where the panic sets in? When you are self-reliant, the what-if conditions run through your mind, and there you see that you should panic. Confidence in the natural world is self-reliance. How am I going to do this? How am I going to face this? It is tough. But don't be faced. I was glad to hear the testimony of Alan tonight. When we pray to the Lord in an unpanic mindset, we will know, we will stand before people and testify to his grace. We run away when we have not been practicing. We have not been doing anything in private. When we are in that state, then when there is a new onslaught of the wiles of the devil, we lose heart instantly. Instead of standing, 
what do we do? We scuttle. And others have to fill the gap until we are sufficiently ashamed to come back. Remember, we cannot stand against the wiles of the devil by our own intelligence. The devil only comes along the lines that God understands. Not along the lines we understand. The only way we can be prepared for him is to do what God tells us. You need, uh, you and I need to understand what God tells us to do in a seemingly difficult situation that is in front of us. Stand complete in his armor, indwelt by his spirit incomplete obedience to him. We do not have to wait for some great onslaught of the enemy. He is here all the time and he is shrewd and cunning and devious. The secret of the sacred struggle, if you will, for prayer lies in the fact that we must stand in the armor of God, practicing what God would have us do, nothing else. Then we can hold the position of prayer against all the attacks of the devil. If you are struggling in prayer, it is because the wiles of the enemy are getting the upper hand. And we must look for the cause, search, what's happening. And you will find it is in the lack of discipline in ourselves. There are certain things we have not been consistently practicing. We used to pray in the morning do we now? What happened to your prayer life? We used to be communing with God over the Bible, spending time until you hear the message. Are we now? Why is that you pick up the phone first thing in the morning to check your email? What causes you to go there? Because of self-reliance, you want to plan out things to handle the challenges of the day, and then you pick up the Bible, already you are under attack. You're not able to pay attention to the Bible. You think, how am I going to handle this person? You try to focus, again you get distracted. You know, how you're doing. We used to be in contact with God wherever we went. Are we now? Put on the whole armor of God and keep continuously practicing. Then the wiles of the devil cannot get you unawares. Second part of the message. 14, 15, 16, and four verses this time. The Lord's own will be preparing courageously. If you are the Lord's own, you will be courageously in preparation to pray. 14a. Would somebody read that, please? Thank you. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, all active, sensible work is symbolized by fastening, keeping things firm, right? Move on to 14 BYMA. Go ahead, read that, please. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, what breaks the armor down? Have you thought about it? There will be excessive fear inordinate, unreasonable amount of fear in us. Or there will be questionable 
affinities or attractions that mar your vision or there will be tampering or meddling with godliness these will all break down the armor 14b we heard read to us having put on the breastplate of righteousness let's spend a few minutes longer than the other areas the righteousness part we need to understand clearly righteousness means rightness in my relationship to other people and their best interests a simpler definition will justify in a short bit dictionaries define righteousness as this behavior that is morally justifiable and right the dictionary definition is characterized by accepted standards of morality justice virtue or uprightness flip it to the bible the bible's standard of human righteousness is god's own perfection in every attribute every attitude every behavior and every word we speak god's laws as given in the bible both describe his own character and also they constitute the plumb line by which he measures human righteousness with me the greek new testament word for righteousness primarily if you look at the interlinear version you will see it describes conduct in relation to others especially with regards to the rights of others in business and in legal matters and beginning with the relationship to god it is contrasted with wickedness the conduct of the one who out of gross self-centeredness neither reveres god nor respects man psalm 33:18 to 22 you will see the bible describes the righteous person as just or right holding to god and trusting in him the bad news is that true and perfect righteousness is not possible for man to attain on his own the standard is simply too high the good news is that the true righteousness is possible for mankind but only but only through the cleansing of sin by jesus christ and the indwelling of the holy spirit we have no ability to achieve righteousness in and of ourselves second corinthians 5:21 tells god made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of god this is an amazing truth in that on the cross jesus exchanged our sin for his perfect righteousness so that we can one day stand before god and he will see not our sin but the holy righteousness of the lord jesus this means that we are made righteous in the sight of god that is we are accepted as righteous and treated as righteous by god on account of what the lord jesus christ has done for us on the cross on the cross jesus was treated as if he were a sinner though he was perfectly holy and pure and we are treated as if we were righteous though we are defiled and depraved see the contrast there on account of what jesus did 
what he has endured on our behalf, we are treated as if we had entirely fulfilled the law of God and had never become exposed to its penalty. We have received this precious gift of righteousness from the God of all mercy and grace. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Verse 15, please. What kind of shoes do you wear? You can look down and see. <laughs> How many of us can say of us, as soon as I heard your step, I felt better? Or do they say, it was when your step came into my life that all went wrong. It was when the step of your friendship began, then I began to lose out with God. Put on the armor of God. Keep the heart, keep your heart right with God. And wherever you go, you will shed the preparation of the gospel of peace. Wherever the saint goes, there is the shedding of the benediction of the blessing of God. Or there is the coming of the conviction of the Spirit of God. You can distinguish the words that you speak. What type of difference will it make? The first part of verse 16, please. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. When I ask you, give me the definition of faith, you will rattle very quickly Hebrews 11.1 1, without even understanding a single word. I'm not going to ask you to recite Hebrews 11.1. 1. But here's the key thing. Faith is unbreakable confidence in, listen to me carefully, personality of God, not in the power of God. Two different things. Faith is the unbreakable confidence in the personality of God, not in his power. There are something over which we may lose faith if you have confidence in God's power only. There's so much that looks like the mighty power of God that is not. We must have confidence in God over and above everything he may do and stand in confidence that his character is untarnished, unblemished, faultless, pure, immaculate. That is his personality. Faith stands under all tests. Job says in Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That is faith. With which, 16b please. with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. When we take the shield over all of faith, none of these things can get through without breaking the shield. We are protected by the covering shield. 17a. And take the helmet of salvation. Your head will be hit that will cause the ultimate damage. Prevention, wear it. What to wear? Helmet, what is the helmet? Salvation. Romans 10, 9 gives us a beautiful, simple explanation. Because if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Oh, that is simple. I do that all the time. Do you? Then you will be, this message will be truly applicable to you. The question is, why, what, all those questions still linger? How is this possible? How is that possible? That contradicts your claim that you are saved. Think about that. 17b. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The spirit brings to our remembrance what the Lord Jesus has said. In order to be able to wield the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, we must obey. Nothing else. And it takes a courageous heart to obey. If you try to apply the teaching of the Lord, apart from the imparted nature of our Lord to our souls, we will make a mess. It is not that we take the Sermon on the Mount as precepts and try to live up to them, but when the Holy Spirit brings to our mind some word of God in certain circumstances will we obey it. That's the part we need to know. It is not the ritualistic type of thing in our life we need to see. It will take courage, but as we obey, the wiles of the devil can be handled all the time and we will stand third and finally last two verses 18 and 19 the lord's own will stand competently in place if you are the lord's own you will be competently in place that is the place where God puts his soldiers clad in his armor and indwelt by his spirit. Whichever place God has placed you in, that is the place he wants you to be held competently. Oh, my position is difficult compared to that person, compared to this person. We are denying God's plan for us. He has kept you in this particular time, in this particular place, for a very specific reason. Some questions we need to consider. Can we pray in prayer? Or are we being captivated by the devil? in the place where he has put you in? Have you been lured into a shrewd, light-hearted cheating? Well, what's wrong with this? Remember, these are the words. What's wrong with this? If that is another favorite line of yours, there is a deep problem inside. Everybody else is doing, why can't I do? That is another thing. Are we not quite so intense as we used to be? Have black and white become a natural gray? Are we no longer so intense about sin as we used to be? We have become so casual. The things we watch on television and anywhere else. Why do we have dual standards when we come to church, when we are at home? If we are maintaining dual standards in our life, we are out of place. We are exactly in the relationship of traitors. We can make known the position that can easily be taken by the devil. Watch and pray said Jesus 
in the center of his agony. If we don't, we will slip into the bait of wrong roads without knowing it. You remember the part two of the message prayer, slipping into the wrong roads, the materialistic, the ritualistic, and the compromising. If, if, you, if you don't remember, it may be a good thing to watch the part two of this message. The only way to keep right is to watch and pray. Prayer on any other basis, any other basis than that on which it is placed in the New Testament is just stupid. And the basis of prayer is not human earnestness not human need, not the human will. It is redemption. Its living center is a personal relationship with the Lord and the filling of the Holy Spirit. A child can pray. Through his own agony in redemption, God has made it easy for us to pray. There is nothing a rationally minded being can ridicule more easily than prayer. Last uh, two verses, 18a, praying always, King James Version says, or ESV says, praying at all times in the spirit. The unutterable simplicity of it, praying at all times. 18b, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. It's very well to have prayer meetings, monthly prayer meetings, bi-weekly prayer meetings, whatever the things, but are we continually practicing in the armor of God? That's a question. Whether you attend our monthly fasting prayer time or not, doesn't matter. If you do, praise the Lord. If you don't know, pray, praise the Lord. Why? The question is, are you continuously practicing in the armor of God? Keeping our hearts stout in the courage of God's spirit and taking our orders from him. Or are we making an ingenious compromise. Preaching and everything else have some type of traps, but prayer has no trap because it is based on the redemption of the Lord and it is made efficacious by the filling of the Holy Spirit. Because that is what you do when you do in prayer. Last verse, and also for me, pray also for me, Paul says, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. We naturally think it is no use praying for Paul, that is for God's servants. God will look after them all right. Remember this, the servants of God are marked for the wiles of the devil and we must pray for them all the time. They are the ones easily attacked. God gives us every now and then an alarming exhibition of what happens if we don't. Throughout the message so far we heard the application. One is reserved for now. This is the application. If this makes you cry, cry. But it's okay to think through it. If a bird sees a trap being set, it knows to stay away. If you go to Proverbs 1 now, look at the following verses. If a bird sees a trap being set, it knows to stay away. But these people set an ambush for themselves. They are trying to get themselves killed. Still don't get it, right? Look at the next verse. 
such is the fate of all who are greedy for money it robs them of life one of the major things that keeps you away from prayer the message is directed to some you can see it in the next slide my dear friend those who are in the hook of this habit it is your choice i'm not going to elaborate what it is the picture will tell the story you are too much into it you are intoxicated by the spiraling graph of that commodity the way it goes up the way it comes down but still you are addicted to playing when the lord wants you to be to put on the armor of god and pray at all times you spend way too much time researching this from day one email is not your problem what the london 4 pm price that is set for that commodity and how it is reacting is what is keeping you awake at night it is your choice but for the rest of you pray at all times put on the full armor of god for your fight is not against flesh and blood but against the principalities and the powers of this dark world may the lord speak to your heart and give you the strength to make necessary changes to have a disciplined life let us pray gracious father we thank you for being with us tonight and pointing out to us where exactly we fail where exactly we compromise 